Okay then, good morning all. Um, first of all, thank you. Ben, ben sends his apologies, he's not in today, so I'm, I'm the stand-in. Okay, some of you know me from one of the tutorial groups. Those of you that don't, my name's Neil, I'm actually the module leader for this. Um, but my, my stage presentation may not match Ben, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, so this week's treat is to move on to look at momentum and force impulse. Okay, and picking up on Ben's slides, which he's been kind enough to let me use, we'll be looking at defining these things, but momentum's probably one of those words that you've all used, that you all know about. Okay, but we'll be looking at a proper definition. Can we cut the chat, please? Thank you. Okay, conservation of momentum is another thing that you will have heard of, but it's a question of really looking into understanding it a bit better. And then, to finish off, we'll be looking at force impulse, which is perhaps something a little bit different that you won't have come across before. So, let's start at the beginning with trying to work out what is momentum. Okay, and if, if you ask somebody in the street what's momentum, it's actually one of those things that's quite hard to define. So, the definition that we use is that momentum is a measure of the quantity of motion possessed by a body. Again, typically we use a lowercase p for momentum. The quantity of motion is a bit of a vague sort of statement, I guess you'd say. Uh, but if you bear with it for a while, you'll, you'll see what we mean. Okay, momentum is defined simply as the mass times the velocity of a body. Okay? Now, we all know that velocity can be expressed as a vector. So, although mass is a scalar, then momentum then is also a vector quantity. Okay, so momentum's got direction as well as size. Units that we use, kilogram meters per second. Still waiting for you to cut the chat at the back, gentlemen. Okay, Newton's second law. A lot of this module focuses on Newton's second law. We know that force is mass times acceleration. We also know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Okay, and if you work through a little bit of simple algebra, what we find out here is that the force is related to the change of momentum. Okay, F ends up as dp by dt. So the force is actually the rate of change of momentum of a body. And the reason we want you to think about that is we can draw some conclusions from that. One of which is that if a particle changes its momentum, then the force must have acted on it. Okay? Because force and change of momentum are so closely related. <coughs> Similarly, if a force acts on a particle, it will result in a change of its momentum. Okay? So, forces acting on bodies and momentum are very intimately sort of linked together. So the whole point of this slide really is, is to get us to understand this close relationship between forces and momentum. And it all comes out of our favourite for this module, Newton's second law. Okay, let's, let's see if we can make sense of, of some of the principles behind this. And what we've got here is a whole bunch of separate particles. Okay, if we choose any two of those, just to, for the sake of the study, okay, and on each of those, we exert an external force. There we go. There are external forces. We mustn't forget, though, that in that block of particles, they're all acting with each other as well. So there are going to be a whole range of internal forces. And thanks to Newton's third law, they tend to be Fij is equal to minus Fji. Okay, so you can see the green arrows down there show that the equal and opposite forces acting between the particles internally. A bit of vector addition. We can work out the, the net forces acting, which give us the blue arrows. Now, the total momentum of all of those particles in my little particle cloud is the sum of the individual masses times velocities. 
I think that's reasonable by just by taking each one in turn. <coughs> Given what we've just learned about the relationship between momentum and force, we can then express that, that the rate of change of the total momentum is the sum of all the forces, external and internal. Okay. Trust me, we, we, we're going somewhere with this. We'll get there in a minute. F total is the total force in the system. Now comes what, what we think is the special part. Newton's third law, all the internal forces cancel each other out. Yeah, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And if you look at the interactions inside our set of particles, all that we're left with are the external ones. Because everything inside that dotted line, Newton's third law, tells us are equal and opposite. So if we look at the system as a whole, the rate of change of momentum is equal to the total of the external forces. So if the external forces on the system as a whole are actually zero, then there's no rate of change of momentum. And then the momentum is conserved. In other words, it's not changed. Okay, so what I've been working towards the last couple of slides is, is this set of words that we're all very familiar with, which is the conservation of momentum. So if you look back when you've got time at those last couple of slides, what you'll see is we're actually making sense of why momentum is conserved. And it's all reliant on Newton's laws. Okay, so if the total external forces on the system are zero, the momentum of the system cannot change. In other words, it's conserved, it's saved. And this principle is known as the conservation of momentum. So there we go. If the total external forces are naught, the rate of change of momentum must also be naught. Okay, so that's been a bit of a preamble leading to a statement that most of you knew already. Yeah, from college, from school, wherever, you're probably all familiar with the idea of the conservation of momentum. What we need to do now, though, is to look a bit more closely at so what? What does that mean? What does that let us do? And what we're going to use it for in the first instance is to look at collisions. And we've got three types of collision. We have inelastic collision, which in reality is almost everything. We've got elastic collision, which is something that we, we strive to attain in some instances. Those of you that play billiards or snooker, we'll know that you've got a very elastic system there. And we've got a thing called superelastic collision, which I think is a bit of a cheat, because superelastic collision relies on something else being in the mix as well. We'll come to that one in a second. So the, the two real ones that I'd like to consider first are inelastic collision and elastic collision. And the key difference between these is not to do with the conservation of momentum, because they all follow the conservation of momentum, but it's what happens to the kinetic energy. Okay, let's run quickly through a bit more derivation. Once again, surprise, surprise, we're starting off with Newton's second law, F equals ma. We know that the acceleration, if we rearrange that, is velocity times the rate of change of velocity with distance, v dv by dx. A little bit of algebra, just to look what happens to the forces. And what we get is that relationship between the half mv squared terms at the bottom, these ones here, and these, as you all know, are our kinetic energy terms. That was in an x direction. We can look at it in x, y, and z, or i, j, and k, and come up with similar expressions. And what we end up with is that the change in kinetic energy is half mv1 squared minus half mv0 squared. Again, I think you should probably all know that. We often express energy with the letter u, an uppercase u, and kinetic energy has a subscript k. So uk is typically kinetic energy. Okay. Units of energy, well, joules. 
is the one we're shorthand. You could also express it as kilogram meter squared per second squared, but that's a bit of a mouthful. So we shall stick to expressing energy as joules. If we accept that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, okay, for any system, we can say that the energy in one state, before something happens in the system internally, must be equal to the energy in the second state, okay? unless something acts on it from the outside. But let's, let's not think about that just yet. If we put all the non-kinetic energies together, that's the Q term, if we add those energies, we end up with a different kinetic energy term, U2. And that value for Q helps us to figure out what's going on in the collision. If Q is real and positive, U1 plus some number equals U2, then what that means is that we have lost some energy in the collision. Okay? And that results in a completely inelastic collision. Okay? We're going to take a little pause from Ben's slideshow here and talk a little bit about, about inelastic collisions. Because some of you, I guess, might be aero students, some of you might be motorsports, and might wish to get involved in the design of vehicles like that in the future. Okay. Inelastic collisions are brilliant if you're designing safety structures. Okay. If you're designing something like a crumple zone in a car or a safety cell in an aircraft, then a lot of what we do is find ways to make that Q number as large as we can so that in the event of a collision, like a, an unwanted collision, we can disperse as much of the kinetic energy as possible in that number there. Okay, so it's not just theoretical stuff. This understanding about these inelastic collisions does come in handy a bit further down the line when we're looking at structures and how they collapse. If Q equals naught, well, going back to the previous slide, that means that the kinetic energy before the collision is retained and the kinetic energy afterwards, they're equal. Sort of place you might see collisions approaching that elastic condition and in things like, like as I said, um, a pool table or a snooker table, okay, where the material chosen for the snooker balls is deliberately arranged to get that collision to be as nearly elastic as is possible. All the energy is conserved. <clears throat> this is the one I don't like very much. If Q is positive, it's greater than naught, the kinetic energy has been gained in the system. But the only way that system can gain energy is from a, some other source. So it's a little bit different to the first two, which is just two bodies coming together and colliding. If Q is positive, it's greater than naught, there must be some other energy source available. Okay, an explosion or a spring or something like that. And that's a super elastic collision. Are you okay so far? Yeah, you've got, I'm just piling through Ben's lecture slides here a little bit. But I'll, uh, any problems, just give me a shout, we'll stop. Okay, so let's look at a collision. Okay, nice straightforward collision, two bodies, two different masses, M1 and M2, two different initial velocities, U1 and U2. So we know we can work out the various energies. <clears throat> because we're dealing with an inelastic collision, we can imagine that the masses sort of stick together. These are Velcro masses, okay? So after collision, they tend to stick together. This isn't a necessary property of an inelastic collision, but it's quite helpful to, to understand what's going on. So let's just think about the momentum, and we'll just think in one dimension. Let's not worry about X, Y, and Z for this. So we've got a measure of the momentum beforehand and we've got a measure of the momentum afterwards where I've just lumped the two masses together because they both will have the same velocity because they've stuck together. 
in the absence of external forces, momentum is conserved, which means we can work out the final velocity. So if we know the initial condition of the masses, <coughs> we can work out the final velocity for these two things. Let's work through some numbers. Quick example, first mass is one kilogram, second mass is two kilograms. First velocity is five meters per second and the second velocity is three. If we do a bit of number crunching, we can calculate the velocity of the two together after this inelastic collision. Okay. If you wanted to check, I'm not gonna do it here, if you want to check, just run through the individual calculations for momentum and you should find that everything comes out nicely equal. So our system there obeyed moment, the conservation of momentum, as every system should. Let's have a look at what happens to the kinetic energy. And you'll see beforehand, this is the, the UK before, with those numbers we get about 21 and a half joules, Use the numbers we've calculated afterwards, we get 20.2. So we have lost kinetic energy in that process. Okay. Inelastic collision, conservation momentum, no problem at all, but what we find is that we do lose kinetic energy. <clears throat> so where's the energy gone? Any suggestions? Noise, somebody said? Heat, where's the heat? Yeah, you, you get deformation. If you imagine two objects hitting each other, you know enough about engineering materials now to know that they'll deform. Okay, and if, if that deformation is plastic, in other words, it's, it doesn't return to its original size, then there's some energy dissipated inside the material, and that appears as heat. <clears throat> Another popular one is noise, actually. You do get some of this energy expressed as sound. It's one of the places where your billiard balls will lose energy because you can hear that energy on collision. So in inelastic collision, really all we're saying is that you're going to lose kinetic energy. And inelastic collision represents pretty much everything to some extent. It's, there's a, there are different degrees of inelasticity, but it does pretty much represent the real world. <clears throat> it is possible to arrange an inelastic collision such that you lose all of the kinetic energy. Okay. Fairly obvious example, if you've got one car coming from this direction, one car from that direction, each of which is travelling at 30 miles an hour and they collide head on, <clears throat> the chances are that the remaining wreckage might actually be zero, zero velocity. Okay, so you can actually dissipate all of the kinetic energy in an inelastic collision. The completely elastic one, however, this is the opposite end of the, of the scale. Masses don't stick together. We like to think of them as bouncing apart. Okay. A completely perfect elastic collision does conserve the kinetic energy as well as conserving the momentum. Okay, and this is, this is back to the snooker balls kind of example, which is very nearly 100% elastic. So let's run through the same little exercise again. Mass one, mass two. They leave, not stuck together, like the Velcro ones, but with different velocities, working through the momentum equations. Conservation momentum means that th that equation is now true. Trouble is we've got two unknowns. We don't know the respective final velocities, so we need another equation. And what we assume is for a 100% for elastic collision, then our kinetic energy is saved as well. So we can come up with a, an energy equation down there. Self-confessed ugly algebra, but what it means at the end of the day is we can work out the final velocities of this system after a purely elastic collision. That's expressed pretty much as a scalar there. If you're actually playing pool, 
It's a two-dimensional vector problem. Well, we hope it's two-dimensional because the ball's supposed to stay on the table. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you do in the pub without realizing it and that professional snooker players do a lot better, which is to evaluate what's going to happen in terms of before and after these elastic collisions or, or in, in that case, very nearly elastic collision. Okay. I don't think they actually do it this way, but fundamentally that's the process, is an understanding of these collisions between two objects. <clears throat> okay, let's see what happens to our same example now, but with similar initial conditions. But this time, let's assume that we've got a perfectly elastic collision. Okay, and we work out our new velocities, V1 and V2. Oh, I thought Ben was going to... No, if we could then go back and check out the kinetic energies there, and almost by definition, because of the way we've produced these equations, you'll find that the kinetic energy is conserved as well. Okay, super elastic, the cheat collision is when the collision is greater than the kinetic energy to start with. The energy after, I should say. Example of this, two masses directly next to each other and surprise, surprise, somebody's let an explosive charge off between them. Which isn't strictly a collision in my book, to be honest with you. Okay, and what you'll see there, of course, is that you have the mass is going off in opposite directions. Because of this, you can see that we can still conserve momentum because we've got one mass with a positive velocity and one with a negative velocity. Okay, so it doesn't contradict any of our suppositions about momentum. Okay, so there we go. Momentum before, momentum after. <coughs> Notice the minus sign, because one of the velocities will be negative. They're going in opposite directions. The only thing we can tell from this, though, is the, is the ratio of the velocities. Depending on the different masses, we can tell the ratio V2 upon V1. We can't tell what the actual values are. Kinetic energy has increased. The chemical energy of the explosive has been converted to kinetic energy, or if it's a spring sort of mechanism, the same thing happens there. The spring energy is converted. Strictly speaking, I don't see that as being quite the same problem. That's, that's super elastic collisions, as I say, a bit of a cheat. Okay, let's stop there for a minute. So that's the whole business about collisions. Okay, Conservation momentum is... So far as we're concerned, universally true. It's always true. Conservation of energy is not true. Okay? Unless you get a 100% elastic collision, then the conservation of kinetic energy is not assured. Even things that are designed to have very elastic collisions, snooker balls, these Newton's cradle toy, desk toys, yeah, where you get the steel spheres banging into each other, <clears throat> They're all designed to be very, very elastic. Okay, but even then, we know that we're losing some of the energy because you can hear it. Plus, if you watch it for long enough, those little Newton's cradles will actually come to rest. Okay, but conservation of momentum, yes. Conservation of energy, not always. Right, let's move on to something new. I'm guessing that you'll all have looked at collisions and conservation momentum in the past sometime. So that was sort of a refresher. What I want to look at now is, is this thing called a force impulse. Okay. Can you tell me what you understand the word impulse to mean? Yeah. What's an impulse? Hmm. Looking for, looking for what you mean by the word impulse, really. Something you don't think about, okay. And, and alongside that, because you're not thinking about it, how do you do it? <laughs> I'm not going to follow that one up. 
Okay, if he's innocent rather than guilty. But yeah, if you think about it, when we do something on impulse, what we tend to do is we tend to do things quickly and without thinking. Yeah? So an impulse is something that happens quickly. If you go to a mathematician and ask what an impulse is, they'll give you a far more precise answer. They'll say that an impulse is some, so let's say a force impulse, and is, <clears throat> is something that lasts for a very, very short time, but has quite a large magnitude. Okay, which ties in with the sort of the, the day-to-day -day use of the word, which is something you do quickly, but it doesn't last very long, and you don't think about it. Okay, and that's the mathematical definition of an impulse. You can narrow it down a bit to, to an unit impulse, which is infinitely short in duration, infinitely large in amplitude, but it still adds up the area underneath it equals one. Okay, so that's an impulse. The closest I can get to an impulse in terms of expressing a force is to hit something sharply with a hammer. Yeah, very large forces acting for a very short time. What we're going to look at now is something a little bit different to that, but only a little bit, because we're allowing the time to spread out a little bit. But do be careful about how we use the word impulse. Okay. And what I want to talk about now is force impulse. We've just been talking about collisions. I've just suggested to you that I can get close to an impulse by hitting something with a hammer. So we're really in the same ballpark. We're looking at things colliding into each other. The impulse of a force is defined as the product of the force and the time for which it acts. At this point, if I had a whiteboard, I'd just draw a graph, force against time, and shade in the, the area underneath as the product. When it's not a constant, we have to define that using an integral, but that's, that's okay, that's not a problem. <coughs> but... Look at what we've done here. We've replaced the F dt, bearing in mind the relationship between force and momentum. Okay, so just in that little line there, we have replaced F dt by dp, because the force is dp by dt, the rate of change of momentum. In other words, the force impulse is the integral of the rate of change of mass times velocity. If we assume the mass stays constant, which in most engineering problems it does, what we find is that the force impulse ends up over there as the change in momentum. So here we go. Thankfully there is a graph in here. <coughs> Vertical axis is force, horizontal axis is time. If we look at what's going on between time one and time two, the area underneath that graph represents for us the force impulse. What units do you think it has? Newton seconds, Newton's times seconds, okay? If we look at a constant force, nice and straightforward, it's mass times the change in velocity. And of quite a few of the examples we do will be assuming constant forces. So for a constant force, the force impulse ends up as the change in momentum. How can we use this? Okay. Well, let's have a little bit of a study about some more collisions. It's definitely collisions morning today. <coughs> yeah, we've done snooker. Let's talk about golf. Now you've got a golf ball which normally starts in condition one as having zero velocity, standing on a T, <coughs> and a mass of 95 grams. Okay? And it reaches a speed of 185 miles an hour. Not if I was holding the club, it wouldn't, but there we go. If we expect that the contact between the club and the ball lasts 0.46 of a millisecond, What's the average force exerted by the club on the ball? And this is the kind of calculation we can do using force impulse techniques. This is golf. This could be, again, two vehicles crashing into each other or, or anything like that. 
The contact between the club and ball is 0.46 milliseconds. Calculate the average force exerted by the club on the ball. Well, let's work out the velocities first and convert them into a sensible set of units, meters per second. V1, sitting on the T, no velocity. V2, which is our 185 mile an hour figure, comes down to 82.7 meters per second. <coughs> so foot pulse, F delta time, 17 kilonewtons exerted. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we've got 17 kilonewtons exerted by the club on the ball for, for less than half a millisecond. And that takes it up from zero to 180 what, something miles per hour. If we then look at F equals MA, we can work out the rates of acceleration for that golf ball. It's 179,800 meters per second squared. Is that a lot? We've got some aero students in here, have we? Yeah? Yeah, you guys like to work in G, don't you? What's that roughly in G? Any ideas? It's about 18,000 G. Okay. If you've got any idea what's the maximum G the human body can survive? I, th I think the world record is, is by some chap who, uh, who crashed a racing car and he, and he was, I think he experienced peaks in excess of 10 G for a very short time. And he survived, I think it's an American car racer. He's, he's probably in the Guinness Book of Records for stupidest record, really. Um, he was in intensive care for 12 months afterwards, I believe. Um, so, human survivability is, is un, realistically is under 10 G. Okay? Golf ball survivability is, is comfortably 18,000 G. Okay? So, being a golf ball isn't a brilliant job, really. Okay. That's it, really. <clears throat> Looks like we're in for an early finish. I've, I haven't paced Ben's slides very well. But let's see what we've looked at today. We've looked at momentum. We've looked at the definition of momentum and where it comes from. Can we cut the chat, please? Okay. Okay. Momentum is mass times velocity. Momentum will be a vector quantity. Pretty much everything I've talked about today, I've not worried about that. I've, I've just been discussing what goes on in terms of scale as in one direction, but we can treat this just the same as any other vector quantity that we deal with. Okay. Units, kilogram meters per second, or alternatively, newton seconds. Momentum and force are very, very closely related. Force is simply the rate of change of momentum. And that comes out of Newton's second law. <coughs> The total change in momentum on a whole system is simply down to the effect of external forces. If there are no external forces, there's no change in momentum. And that principle is known as the conservation of momentum. Okay? In every collision type, momentum is conserved. Just get that in your heads right now. Momentum is always conserved. The types of collisions, however, deal with kinetic energy differently. <coughs> Real collisions, if you like, this is my crashing cars and all the rest of it. Inelastic collisions, kinetic energy is inevitably lost. Okay. Elastic collisions, which some, some instances we strive to attain, kinetic energy is conserved. Right, can you all shut up just for the next 10 minutes? Okay, it doesn't take long. Bit of attention. Okay, the elastic collision, we conserve the kinetic energy as well as the momentum. Okay, super elastic collisions, as I said at the beginning, different sort of category, there's extra things happening in here. 
Okay, so they're not strictly just two objects meeting. There's an additional energy source. The other thing we worked on too was the force impulse, defined as a force multiplied by the time for which it acts. Okay, and it's showing that force impulse is equivalent to the change in momentum. So we can work out things like the forces that are involved in collisions. So we can look at, again, taking something like our survivable zones in vehicles as an example. Not only can we see in these collisions completely inelastic what happens to the energy, we can also calculate the forces that go into the structure during those collisions. Okay, so again, if you're designing crash absorbent structures, you need to know what the forces are in order for your design to work. If force is constant, then we assume that the force delta T is simply equal to delta momentum. Okay, that's just running through Ben's slides for today. Very simple stuff, really. All you've looked at is collisions. Okay, and most of you should have covered collisions in a past life, in college or in school or what have you. Okay, so it's a refresher, really, in terms of momentum and energy. The only thing that might be new to you is this concept of force impulse. And force impulse lets us work out a lot more about what's going on within a collision rather than just the conservation momentum sort of approach. Okay, that'll do. Thank you.